Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinkers series proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. Welcome to the Origin Science Scholars Program, a series of talks on current research topics in origin sciences. Hello, my name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I am pleased to serve as your host for this series. The talk you're about to watch is entitled From Fluctuations to Galaxies. In this talk, Chris Mihos, Professor and Chair of Astronomy at Case Western Reserve University and a Fellow of the Institute for the Science of Origins, will tell you how galaxies and clusters of galaxies grew from tiny concentrations of matter and energy in the early universe. Please enjoy the talk. If you remember the last time we left it off with, with Glenn's image of the Hubble Deep Field here, we were going from fluctuations from the nothing to the something, and we'd gotten sort of to this tantalizing image, which is the beginnings of the universe. When we look out far enough, we're looking back in time. And so what we're seeing are some of the, the most distant galaxies, some of the earliest galaxies in the universe. And the thing is, to really understand how galaxies are forming, you have to look a little closer. You have to realize that galaxies have a range of properties from beautiful spiral galaxies like this. These are spiral disks, so stars and gas rotating in a, in a disk. This is much like our own Milky Way. Lots of new stars forming, lots of dust clouds forming in, in these galaxies, all the way to elliptical galaxies like this. This is a, a nearby elliptical galaxies. In, in this kind of galaxy, you don't have stars moving in nice circular disk-like orbits. It's like a beehive. Stars are moving every which way. Generally, the stars in these galaxies are much older than what we see in spiral galaxies. And if you look, I mean, you can see through the galaxy. You can see the little galaxies behind it. That is, these galaxies don't have lots of dust, lots of gas, lots of new stars forming that block our view. So they're very different types of galaxies. And so when we go from a picture, a very theoretical picture of, of, of nothing to something, we've got to take a different path at some point because those somethings have to grow up to be spiral galaxies or elliptical galaxies. And the trick is to figure out what those different paths are. And so that's what I want to talk about today, is sort of how do we go from these little fluctuations that Glenn talked about last week to grown up mature galaxies that look so different from one another. So we're going to start, since we live in a spiral galaxy, I figured it'd be good to start by talking about a spiral galaxy. Let's, let's look at making a spiral galaxy. And I'm going to start with what Glenn left us last time, which is the microwave background. This is a snapshot of the universe at one of its earliest times. And what you're seeing are very low-level ripples of matter, very, very low-level fluctuations. And if we draw a line and ask, what is, the, what is the density of matter along that line? It might look something like this where there's an average density, right? The universe has some average density at that point. But as you look along different patches, sometimes the density gets quite high, sometimes quite low. And I tried to, I'm not the greatest artist, but I tried to sketch the idea that the smaller fluctuations, these smaller density enhancements are actually denser. And a big density enhancement, like, like the one on the left, is sort of low level and broad. And this, gives rise to what we call density fluctuation spectrum, which is, I think, where, where Glenn left, left us last time, where small things, they have a high density, and big things have a much lower density. And this becomes critically important to think about these little fluctuations and these big fluctuations in the early universe, because the collapse time, and what do we mean by collapse time? It's not a catastrophic event to an astronomer. What we mean is simply the time it takes for gravity to pull everything together to form a galaxy. The collapse time, and you can work this out, this is one of these tasks we make our first year freshman students do. The collapse time is shorter for denser regions. That's what that 
equation is basically saying. The higher the density, the faster the collapse time. And what that means is that since the smaller things are denser, they're gonna collapse faster. And the bigger things are gonna take a long time. And so you, you, you leave yourself with this theoretical picture where things are collapsing at different times and it's the little things that are collapsing first. But the thing to remember, if I go back to this picture, is a lot of times the little things are sitting on top of the big things. So what you have is a situation where in this environment, the little things are collapsing down first, and they're embedded in bigger things which collapse down later. And you think, all right, he's talking about things. What things? What are these things that we're talking about? So let's talk about <coughs> galaxies. This is a very schematic way of thinking about a galaxy. But what I want you to do, this is what we call, what astronomers call a merger tree. And time runs down from the top. And the width of this tree, the thickness, is the mass of a galaxy, a growing galaxy, okay? So what you wanna think is, at the bottom, today, you have a nice big galaxy. And as you track back, what was that galaxy like farther and farther in the past, you see branches splitting off. In other words, it was in littler things as you go back in time. And if we keep going back in time, it's even, even more littler things. So you have a picture which we call hierarchical collapse, where in the universe you've got matter strewn around, little things start coming together, those little things then come together to form bigger things, those bigger things come together to form even bigger things. And so there's not one time, you can't snap your fingers and say, okay, a galaxy formed today. Because the galaxy is sort of forming the whole way through. The stars that are in that galaxy may have formed long ago, but the galaxy itself may have come together relatively recently. And so it becomes kind of hard to say, when did the galaxy form? So instead of saying that, let's ask how does the galaxy form? One of the great things about astronomy these days is, is the, the fact that we can make enormous simulations on computers and ask the tough questions that you can't work out with pen and paper. And so what I'm gonna show you is a simulation of dark matter. This is that magic word that Glenn left out last week. <laughs> so dark matter is most of the matter in the universe. We don't know what it is, we have ideas, but what we do know is we know a lot about how it acts. And really it acts just in the form of gravity, at least for the scales that I'm interested in. And so what we can do is we can set up a simulation where we have mass distributed through the universe the way we think it was in the early universe. You can see this simulation kind of looks, what you're seeing is the density of matter, and it kind of looks like that early simulation, or sorry, that early picture of the universe. And what we can do is have the computer just say, all right, gravity pulling all this mass together, what does it look like? And as you watch, you can see gravity's pulling things together into small clumps, and then those small clumps are pulling together to make even larger clumps. And so if we had dark matter glasses, which I'd love to sell to the physicists, but if we had dark matter glasses, this is what our universe would look like. This is what a galaxy in our universe would look like. You can see there's a large central mass of dark matter and lots of little things buzzing around it. So, but we don't see dark matter. And in fact, the things that we see, stars, dust, planets, they're made out of normal material, just regular old normal uh, particles. And so we can ask the computer, we can put in the rules for evolving gas clouds, these are hydrodynamical simulations, we can put that in the computer and say, if we followed the gas clouds in this forming galaxy, what would that look like? And so this is not exactly the same simulation, but it's a very similar one. This soft blue is gas, gas clouds, hydrogen gas clouds in the universe. And you can see as the gas clouds come together, they look much like that simulation I just showed. You can see things slamming together. But over time, what I hope you can see is some darker blue things showing up. And those are the stars that are forming. 
And now you can see that as the gas comes in, it starts rotating in a disc-like pattern, right? And the reason for this is very simple. Angular momentum, that is the, the, the uh, energy in spin, as something contracts, it speeds up. So it spins faster and faster. And so what you're seeing is clouds of gas coming into the galaxy and that galaxy spinning up. And at the end, you have something that looks very much like a disk galaxy. Rotating disk, you, it's a little bit hard to see, but there are the, the dark blue are the stars in this galaxy. And there's still lots of little things around that galaxy falling in. This looks much like our own galaxy. We have a rotating disk. We have what we call satellite galaxies, which are smart, small galaxies that orbit our own. And over time, you can see it continually builds up this, this rotating disk. So this is what we think. I mean, I've, I've shown you now something that in the computer just took us a couple minutes. But in reality, this is about 10 billion years of evolution. It's the great thing about computers. We can, we can take these snapshots in the sky and link them together into an evolving universe. And there's our galaxy at, at, the, uh, at the current day. So, okay, you know, computers are great. You can cook anything you want in a computer. But do we actually see this going on, right? As an astronomer, I'm always bound by the real world. If I'm doing a computer simulation of how galaxies are forming, I ought to be able to ask reality, is that what we see? So we'll go back to the Hubble Deep Field, this image. And again, remember what you're looking at here is you're looking out through the universe, and the farther out you look, the longer it's taken the light to reach us, and so you're looking back in time. And so the, the bigger galaxies you see on here, they're a little bit closer to us. But as we look out further and further, the little tiny flecks, some of those are some of the most distant galaxies we know about. And we've conveniently put boxes around them, and I'll zoom in on them now. And this is what they look like. The numbers are what astronomers call redshift. They're a, they're a way of tagging how distant the galaxies are. But these are some of the most distant galaxies that have ever been observed. They're galaxies that are, that are appearing when the universe was very young. And what you see is they don't look like beautiful spiral galaxies. In fact, what you see are things that are small, not just small because they're far away, but because they're physically small objects. And many of them are in the process of running together, colliding with one another. And that's exactly what we saw in those early stages of the simulation as gravity pulls lumps together. If we look not quite so far away, so this is looking back to the very earliest parts of the universe, if we look maybe halfway across the universe, we're looking essentially halfway back in time, then things are looking a little more regular. You can see that some of these galaxies, they're still, you know, they're still pretty far away. They're still, these are Hubble Space Telescope images, so they're, they're still a little bit hard to see. But you can see they're looking more like a spiral galaxy. So this is sort of, these are galaxies halfway through the evolution of the universe, and they're starting to settle into their disk-like shape. And if we go, and here, let me just, you know, for example, this one right here, this is a big galaxy with that little companion. That's exactly what we're seeing in some of those simulations. So if we conceptually go even nearer, this is what these galaxies are gonna grow up to be. This is the Andromeda galaxy. This is the nearest galaxy to us, the nearest big galaxy to us. Uh, spiral galaxy, it's actually even a little bigger than our own Milky Way. And you can see that to this day, we still have these little satellites. This guy up here, this one down here. And the Andromeda galaxy as a whole is still, if we look very deeply, we can still see things falling into the outskirts. And this is how we think a spiral galaxy builds up that the inner regions, the denser parts, formed very early in the universe, and then over time, things slowly fall in, quietly fall in, and you build a galaxy, we refer to it as inside out. And so the inner regions, in this case, the, the bulge of Andromeda, contain some of the oldest stars in that galaxy. 
And in the outskirts, that's where the gas has fallen in more recently, where new stars are forming, and over time, stuff still falls in towards the, the outskirts. Okay. And in the end, you have a spiral galaxy like this. If we could step outside of our own galaxy and look back on it, it would look similar to this. We're seeing you know, a picture of our, of our own system. So why don't I stop there, just with the reminder that we go from the little building blocks through this slow formation of a disk to a modern day galaxy. You refer to the gases that are forming and spinning. What kind of gases? Do we know anything about this? Yeah. And are they uniform throughout these uh, different galaxies? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the, we actually know quite a bit about the gas that's in galaxies. Luckily, it's, it's, uh, it emits light, it emits radiation, we can detect it. The gas in galaxies is mostly hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element in the universe, and so that's what most of the stuff in the universe is made of, most of the normal stuff is made of. So the, this mostly hydrogen gas, some helium, and a very little bit of what we call heavy elements, things like carbon, oxygen, neon, the stuff that, you know, we're made up here. The interesting question that you're asking, is it the same in all galaxies? The reason that that's different is because those heavy elements, the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, that's built up inside of stars and then released in supernova explosions to be put back into the galaxy. And so what we see is some of the earliest galaxies that haven't had many generations of stars, those are also galaxies that don't have a lot of these heavy elements. But a galaxy like our own, our own Milky Way, which has had many generations of stars born and die, we have heavier, or sorry, we have more of these heavy elements. So by understanding what, those, what the gas is made up of, that helps us understand something about how the galaxy has evolved with time. As the gas is collected into the galaxy, is the density of the space it was in reduced, or, or, or does something come in to fill its space? It, the, way it, the way it really looks is that you start with a very tenuous, nebulous distribution of gas. And as it falls in, it's getting denser and denser as it, we call it accreting, as it falls into the disk. Over time, we think the surrounding environment, the intergalactic medium is what we call it, we think that intergalactic medium is getting patchier and thinner because it's falling into the galaxies. What are the numbers in the individual slides? Oh, those, those are what we call redshift. It, it, they, they, they're related to how far away the galaxies are or conversely, how, how early in the universe we're seeing them. Bigger numbers mean very early in the universe. So these are, gal these are galaxies that we, we see as they were when the universe was only maybe a billion years old. In your first simulation, it looked like a lot of things were being collected, but a high fraction was also being ejected. And the gas, it looked like most of it stayed in. And that's... That's, that's um, you're actually absolutely right. The, the difference, one of the big differences between gas and dark matter, dark matter, as I said, it only, it only interacts under gravity. But what gas can do is you can have, if you have two gas clouds coming together, they'll stick, hydrodynamic forces, pressure, density, you know, will actually cause them to stick. And that makes them move inwards, right? They lose energy, they lose, uh, 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 they, they convert some of the angular momentum to the surrounding regions, and they, it's sort of a one-way pipe. They just, they lose energy and angular momentum and move towards the center. Whereas the dark matter doesn't lose that, that energy as efficiently. Right? So it, you know, it has an ability to buzz around at, at large distances from the center, whereas the gas tends to move inwards. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching Dr. Chris Mihos of Case Western Reserve University discussing the evolution of structure in the universe. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the first part of his talk, Dr. Mihos looked at how spiral galaxies, like our own Milky Way, were formed. In the second part, Dr. Mihos will discuss how elliptical galaxies emerged. Now we return to the lecture. I've given you half the story, actually a third of the story. Um, let's talk about the other type of galaxy, which is the elliptical galaxies. So as I said, these are very different types of galaxies. They don't have a lot of ongoing 
new stars forming. They don't have a lot of this dusty cold gas in the, in the galaxy. And the stars are moving every which way. They're not a, a simple rotating disk. So what's going on here? Well, think w back to what I said about the spiral galaxy. It was a nice, slow, smooth process where things fell in and sort of assembled into the disk. And the things that were falling in were small. So you weren't disturbing the big galaxy, you were just sort of accreting, bringing material into the outskirts. Well now what I want you to do is think about, well what happens if instead of letting a little thing come in, yet another big thing just comes slam in there, right? All the stars in this galaxy which are, you know, minding their own business, orbiting in a nice simple rotating sense, all of a sudden this big galaxy comes crashing in and its gravity will distort and, and disperse the stars every which way. So if you think about an environment which is much more um, rapidly assembling, or an environment which, where the collisions are much more dramatic, you may get a very different outcome. And so you think, okay, well, can we see that happening? These are images from the Hubble Space Telescope of galaxies in the relatively nearby universe. And you see a lot of strange looking things. They're all associated with galaxies, big galaxies coming together gravity pulling these, these galaxies together, and you see this wild array of shapes, right? Some are still looking like a rotating disk, others have these streamers of stars coming out of them, and you think, well, what, what in the world's going on there? Again, the beauty of this is that we can appeal to computers to help us sort this out. The, a, a collision of galaxies like this, if we wanted to watch the whole thing happen, it would take, you know, a billion years, which is an awful long time to wait at the telescope and watch it happen. So we have to rely on the computers to do it. So what I want to show you now is a set of simulations that, uh, or a, a single simulation of colliding galaxies that I did with uh, my collaborator Lars Hernquist uh, at Harvard. And what happened was we did this simulation of galaxy mergers and a third colleague of ours at the Space Telescope Science Institute said, hey, let me grab those because we see many galaxies that look like that from Hubble. And so what he did, this is Frank Summers, he did this spectacular job of making the simulations and blending them with the, uh, the actual Hubble images. So this is what, if we could sit around for a billion years, this is what a galaxy merger would look like. You start off with the two spiral galaxies coming together and we're sort of, we're flying around as, as time goes by, and crossfade every now and again to real galaxies that we see with Hubble. So here, the galaxies are moving together at the same time we're sort of shifting our camera angle. And here, they've sort of hit for the first time, but they don't actually stick. They pass through each other. So here, the galaxies are sort of passing through, and if we let time go again, they pull apart. But what's happening is the gravitational forces from each galaxy pulls streamers of stars away. We call these tidal tails. And over time, the galaxies sort of come back on their orbit and fall back together. Here's another Hubble image of colliding galaxies. And eventually, the two galaxies will coalesce into one. And so this process, this is something we see going on, as I said, in the universe today. But if you think about what the universe looked like in its early days, it was much denser. A lot of the galaxies were closer together. Things were falling in. It was a very violent period. So while this, we see this happening around us today, it was also going on quite a bit in the early universe. So this is, a nearby galaxy, this is, uh, goes by the, the astronomy name NGC 7252. Uh, it was renamed by uh, one famous astronomer, the Atoms for Peace galaxy because of the peace sign looking tidal tails sticking out the sides. But this is a galaxy that we think is a elliptical forming in the nearby universe. Those two streamers, those two tidal tails tell us that it once was two disk galaxies that have since coalesced, and now we're looking at, if we wait on this galaxy for a few billion years, we think it'll look like a normal, regular run-of-the-mill elliptical. But let me get back to Richard's question about the black holes, 
right? Let me show you another simulation that we've done. And I gotta say, this one, I did the animation. You can usually tell the closer the animation comes to me doing it, the cruder the animation looks. I don't have the skills that, that the folks at Space Telescope have. What I want you to imagine now is that same simulation, but instead of standing back and watching it happen, you're now riding along with one of the galaxies. So you're pinned looking down at this galaxy as it goes through its orbit. And what I'm showing you here are just the gas clouds in the galaxy. So here they are rotating. We're looking sort of at the center of the galaxy. Here's the other galaxy just came flashing through. And this is that issue about gas clouds sticking together. And what's happened is they've moved inwards. And so a lot of that, the, the gas has started co uh, coalescing in the inner regions. Now the galaxies come back together again. And all that gas is, or not all, but most of that gas is being driven down to the very central regions. At the same time, some of the gas is coalescing into a disk around it. And if I let this go and then we'll stop it in a second and orbit around, you'll see that this, this gas disk that's, that's left over is sort of a warped, there you go, a warped gas disk. All right, why is that important? Well, if we've driven all this gas down to the very central regions of the galaxy, what's living there? A big black hole. If you take a black hole and you drop material on it, as it falls down, as it, as it moves down into the gravitational field of the black hole, the energy, the kinetic energy, the energy of motion as it's falling down causes, it converts that energy into heat and it becomes very hot. And as it hits the, the, the region around the black hole, it forms a disk and it can actually shoot gas out the poles. This is what we call a quasar. And so what we're seeing is that the act of ramming two galaxies together like this is a very efficient way of taking a lot of the gas in that galaxy and feeding this black hole and causing a quasar. Okay, so if we're building that, again, the universe should show us that process. These are Hubble images of quasars. Before Hubble went up, we really couldn't see what was going on. We could see the quasar itself, just this very bright source of light but we couldn't really see what was going on around it. So these were some of the very first images, in fact, that came out of Hubble. And what you see, these quasars, which are the brightest things in the center of each image, are surrounded by galaxies, many of which look like they're in this process of collision. So again, the simulations are saying to us that these gas clouds should be feeding quasars. We look out in the universe and we see that many of these quasars are, in fact, going through this collision process. So this is how you grow. You keep throwing stuff into that black hole, it grows with time. So let me introduce you to one of my favorite galaxies, which is called Centaurus A. It's actually the nearest elliptical galaxy to us. Unfortunately, you can't see it from the northern hemisphere. You have to go to the southern hemisphere to see it. But this is the nearest galaxy, nearest elliptical galaxy to us, and it looks funny, right? Right away you can say, well, that doesn't look like the other galaxy. That's got a lot of dust in it, right? What you're seeing is, think of a, a beehive, a ball of stars, but now there's a big disk of dust in there. And so you're trying to look at it through that, that dust cloud, that, that uh, disk of dust that's blocking your view. And this is what we knew about Centaurus A for many years until Another space telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, went up. Unlike Hubble, Spitzer's geared to work in the infrared. And while you can't see through dust with regular light, infrared light can penetrate the dust. And so it gave us our first view of what the inner regions of Centaurus A look like. And this is what we're seeing. So that the, the, the soft white is just, again, the regular stars, but that pinkish reddish color there, what you're seeing is the dust in the very inner regions of Centaurus A of this galaxy. And if you look, I mean, what that looks to me is a warped disk of, of dust. Dust goes with gas, so if you're seeing the warped dust, there's a warped disk of gas that goes there too. So this is looking very much like the end of that simulation that I showed you. So let's take it further. All right, what I said was in that process of merging, we were triggering a quasar well, 
Sen A is not a quasar, it's not bright enough. There's not enough energy coming out. But this collision probably happened one, two billion years ago. So the, the energetic part of the quasar's lifetime is over. But we can still see signatures. This image, this is, I, this is just a spectacular image. This is all the observatories uniting their power. You're seeing the optical image. You can see the dust cloud the, uh, crossing the, the disk. Um, you also see the blue and the orange that's coming out. Those are radio waves and x-rays. And what's happening, remember I said that as stuff fell onto the quasar, it was ejected out in these, in these jets of energy, of energetic particles? That's what we're seeing. We're seeing those particles streaming out right perpendicular to the plane of the, the gas. So this is what the nearest elliptical galaxy to us looks like. It has all the hallmark signatures of being formed in a merger a few billion years ago. And so now you have to say, okay, if you buy this, right? The nearest galaxy, the nearest elliptical galaxy to us is a merger remnant. Well, did we just get lucky? Right, did we just happen to be fortunate that we live next to a merger remnant that looks like an elliptical? Or is it more likely that this is how elliptical galaxies form? And that any elliptical galaxy we would live next to, we would see these kind of signatures. Now it's a little strong. We don't see these signatures in every elliptical galaxy. So I'm certainly not saying that every single elliptical formed this way. But certainly this process of rapid assembly, of merging big things together, this looks to be one of the dominant ways to form elliptical galaxies. It's a very different formation mechanism, of a different formation history from what spiral galaxies look like. And if we wait a billion, two billion years more, Sene will probably look very similar to this. So, I'm gonna go back to the building blocks, right? These are, these are the, the primordial pieces of things that grow up to be galaxies. But to make the elliptical galaxies, you go a different path. You go, the path that I've shown you is big things merging together, and we've seen that in the nearby universe. But like I said, that happened very commonly in the early universe as well. So it's not just happening today, it happened long ago. And at the end of this process, we end up with things that we call elliptical galaxies today. Do spiral galaxies predominate in the universe? And if they do, do they, pr or do they predominate closer to us and the elliptical ones will be further out? If I look in the universe as a whole, the nearby universe as a whole, most of the big galaxies are in fact spiral galaxies, yes. But there's something which we call morphology density relationship. And what that means is that the number, the fraction of spiral galaxies changes depending on what part of the universe you're looking in. Where we live, we, we refer to it as the field, just general random piece of space. But if you look at galaxy clusters, which I'll talk about in a minute, the density of galaxies is much higher in those regions. And in those, galaxy, in those regions of space, the galaxies are predominantly elliptical. So that's the first piece of information, is that the type of galaxy you are changes depending on whether you're in a random piece of the galaxy or of the of the universe or in one of these dense clusters. The other thing is that as we look out into the distant universe, the number of normal galaxies, things that you go, oh, that looks like, you know, a normal spiral galaxy, drops. And what we see as we look very far out, so very far back in town in time, is that the galaxies we see look weird. In other words, they don't look smooth and simple, oh, spiral, oh, elliptical. They look like strange things, little fragments coming together. Again, this, this picture that the universe is evolving with time from these little merging fragments of the early universe to the galaxies, the, what we call normal galaxies today. So it, it changes both in space and in time. We have the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies colliding. So when we become the Milky Andromeda way, will we be an elliptical? Right, so, so the question is, talks about the fact that when we look out at the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest spiral galaxy to us, it is moving towards us. 
And we think that in the next few billion years, we're not quite sure when, but in the next few billion years, our galaxy and Andromeda will merge together. And at that point, yes, at that point, the violence of that merger will scramble both galaxies up to the extent that we will be, if we're around, you know, in five billion years, we may well be living in an elliptical galaxy. The expansion, how do we, how do we reconcile all you've told us about this tonight with the big picture of the expansion of the universe? Now, you're, you only mention gravity as the force here, and gravity is clearly pulling these things on a small scale together. But at the same time, dark energy question mark is pushing everything apart. How, how do you put those two together? Right, so the question is how do I, you know, I've been talking about ga gravity pulling things together, but yet we know at the same time, or we believe we know at the same time, that dark energy, whatever it is, is causing things to move apart faster and faster. And the answer is that on small scales, like, like galaxies, gravity has won. The density of matter in those regions is high enough that gravity's already won that game, and that's what pulls things together. But on even larger scales, that's where dark energy takes over. And what that means is that, remember how I said that things were falling in on the galaxies at larger and larger distances? That's, that's still gonna hold, but if I think of that picture even larger, if I think about building galaxy clusters, which I will in a minute, on the very largest scales, the accelerated expansion of the universe is eventually gonna win. And so stuff that gravity trying to pull things together on the largest scales will ultimately stop. And so if I wait 10, 20, 50 billion years, at that point, everything that's been built will have been built. Gravity won't be able to pull anything else together because dark energy will have won at that point. But right now we're still living in an era where on galaxy and galaxy cluster scales, things are still falling in. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Chris Mihos. Dr. Mihos is Professor and Chair of Astronomy at Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, we learned that elliptical galaxies probably formed when two large spiral galaxies merged. In our final segment, Dr. Mihos will look at how clusters of galaxies evolved. Now, back to Dr. Mihos. We need to go talk about these galaxy clusters and, and maybe some of the, the animations will, uh, will uh, bring you some, some uh, will pique your interest on that. So, so we've made galaxies of different flavors, but if I look out in the universe like we've been talking about, I do see the fact that parts of the universe have a much higher density of galaxies, and these are the galaxy clusters. So what, what you're looking at here is a relatively nearby galaxy cluster, but each one of those blobs now is a galaxy in its own right. And so in this region of space, you have hundreds of big galaxies. And this is, on this scale, this is where, where uh, you know, we talked about little things forming within big things, that's what you're seeing. The little things were the galaxies, but now in these regions of space, the density is so high that it's pulled those galaxies together into a galaxy cluster. And so the question is, how do we build that? Right. So let's put our dark matter glasses back on. And what I'm gonna show you is a simulation. Now the simulations I showed you before were sort of what to an astronomer we would call small scale, although still many, many uh, hundreds of, hundreds of uh, thousands of light years. What I'm showing you here now is even larger still. This is a large patch of the universe in this simulation where we're looking at the density of dark matter in the early universe, and if I let gravity do its thing, what you're gonna see is things collapsing which again, to astronomer just means condensing, on filaments, right? They don't just all fall to the center, they fall onto these filaments, and over time, these filaments of dark matter then come together to form, in this case, this big thing, your color coding here is by density, so white is the densest regions. And what you're seeing forming at the center of this simulation is what would be a big cluster of galaxies. And the reason I show this is I wanna give you that sense that it's not just everything falling pump to the center, but things falling into smaller 
or sorry, smaller things falling into larger things, and then those larger things falling together to make even larger things. So what I'm gonna do is now show you, this was the dark matter, I'm gonna show you what the stars would look like that are in the galaxies that are riding along with this dark matter. And this is a simulation that uh, I did with a, a few of my students a few years ago, where now everything you're seeing here, I've taken my dark matter glasses off, and I'm just looking at the stars in these simulations. And there you can see these, the formation, you can see that filament type structure here. And what you have are groups of galaxies that are forming. The individual galaxies formed a while ago, the groups are now forming. And then over time, those groups fall together to become a big cluster. So this is a, I know this is kind of, you know, you've got, it's a negative image here, you're looking at black on white, so just invert your, your, uh, your color scheme there. But what I I'm gonna run this again, and what I want you to watch is that as the galaxies come together, remember that simulation I showed you of just two galaxies and those thin streamers of stars that were coming out? The same thing is happening here all over the place. Those stars are being pulled out of their, their home galaxy and over time are being strewn around into this cluster to form this diffuse halo of, of stars. So if I, want, if I let this go again, you can see these thin, small streamers of stars coming out. And eventually, I mean, I was, it's like a mix master. Eventually these thin streams of stars get all scrambled up into this diffuse pile of starlight. That diffuse pile of starlight that lives outside of the host galaxies, outside of their original home, we refer to that as the intracluster starlight. So it's stars that are still part of the cluster but don't call an individual galaxy their home. So let's go and take a look at, in a little bit more detail, individual uh, groups of galaxies. This is a galaxy cluster, or sorry, galaxy group um, known as Stefan's Quintet. Quintet, excuse me. I think most of you know this one. You just may not know you know this one. This is a great time of year to do this talk. Remember, it's a wonderful life. The scene at the beginning of the movie when Clarence is in heaven talking to the angels, this is what you're seeing, right? Clarence, I believe, lives they bring Clarence in. He, I think he gets up here in the galaxy's flash as they talk to him. So when it comes on again this season, watch for it. You're watching uh, uh, Stefan's Quintet. Now, this was an old image. Uh, this is the image that was used in the movie. With the Hubble Space Telescope, we have a much clearer image. And this is what the Quintet looks like to the Hubble. And what you're seeing is the group of galaxies, actually the, the blue one on the lower right, that's not part of the group. It's actually in the foreground. So see if you can take that out of the picture with your mind. But the other galaxies, you're seeing those galaxies in collision and those streamers of stars being pulled out in this group environment. Right? So this is that first step of galaxy cluster building, forming the groups of galaxies that are then gonna fall together to form the cluster of galaxies. Again, hierarchical collapse is what we call this. So on even bigger scales, this is the nearby galaxy cluster known as the Hercules Cluster because it's in the constellation of Hercules. And what you can see here is many galaxies in collision. There's this pair here. There's this pair here. There's this one. It's kind of hard to see, but this is actually... I can show you really faintly, there are these tidal streamers coming out of this galaxy. So we are catching this cluster in the process of assembling. Right? And this is one of the reasons why the Hercules cluster actually has a large number of spiral galaxies. Remember I said most, most galaxy clusters are dominated by ellipticals. Hercules is a little different. And we think what's happening is it hasn't, you know, it's only coming together now and so all that violence that can turn the spirals into the ellipticals hasn't really happened yet in Hercules. This is another galaxy cluster, the Coma Cluster. This we think is much more evolved. Most of the galaxies in Coma are ellipticals. You can see this, 
you know, things that look like this, these guys, these are all elliptical galaxies. So, I showed you my favorite galaxy before, I'll show you my, my favorite galaxy cluster now, which this is the Virgo cluster. This is the nearest cluster of galaxies to us. It's about 50 million light years away. And what you're seeing here, this galaxy here at the center, this is the center of the Virgo cluster. This is the galaxy known as M87. And these are other big elliptical galaxies. Here's another elliptical galaxies that are sort of orbiting around in the cluster. And we here at CASE, we've started a project to basically look for the streamers of stars that we think are coming out as the galaxy cluster assembles. We refer to this sort of as galaxy cluster archaeology. We're looking for the remnants, the things that were pulled out of the galaxies long ago as the cluster was coming together. Now here's the problem. These streamers of stars that showed up so beautifully in the simulations, they're really faint. I want you to think about going out to the darkest sky you've been to. Go out to the desert, you know, in the middle of Arizona, moonless night, right, pitch black. You look up, you see all the stars. Think about looking at the space between the stars, just the black, dark sky. The starlight we're looking for is 100 times fainter than that dark sky. This is our telescope out in Arizona. This, is, uh, this actually is a time-lapse shot that was um, taken by one of my undergraduate students when he was out there a few years ago. Uh, you can see he's standing next to the telescope. That's the moon over in the right that's starting to set. You can see his flashlight bobbing along the trail as he, he set up his camera for a time-lapse and he ran with his flashlight and you can see it bobbing. And then he rotated the dome to the telescope so that you, the dome opening itself acted like a shutter. And so it looks like he's peeled away the dome. These are the things our undergraduates do for fun. <laughs> we have spectacular students here at Case. So what I want to do is show you our picture of the Virgo cluster where we're looking fainter and fainter for this stray starlight. So this is, and forgive the technical jargon on this, but this is our picture of the central regions of Virgo. You see there's a, a hole right there. That's not a black hole. That's a star in our own galaxy that we've put our digital thumb over because we don't want to be blocked by the glare of those stars. So, so you'll see these holes showing up. They're not black holes, they're, they're artifacts of our own imaging. But this is what the galaxy cluster looks like. The, the color scheme is just intensity, it's just brightness, so don't, the orange doesn't mean anything. But as I look fainter and fainter, I'm starting to see the very faint outskirts of the galaxies. And if I look fainter and fainter, you can now see coming out of that big central galaxy, M87, you can see these streamers of starlight, which are the, the remnants, the archeological remnants of galaxies that have been ripped up as they've been orbiting in the, in the Virgo galaxy cluster. So we see, you know, we see the, the big stream here, another stream there, another stream over here. We see a stream up here. All of these things are attesting to sort of the violence of assembly of a galaxy cluster. So when you look at these beautiful images that come out, this is a ground-based telescope, so a telescope here on the Earth, but Hubble Space tells these beautiful images. What you have to realize is hiding, lurking in the, in the faint shadows in a way, is a much different picture. And that very faint picture is what holds the, the history, the signatures of the history of galaxy formation. And that's a large part of what we're trying to do here at CASE. I work on galaxy clusters like this. Other colleagues of mine are looking for these faint streamers of light in the halos of our own galaxy, of the Milky Way. So we see them on big scales and we see them on small scales. And it's really, this is the area that we're now probing to understand how galaxies form. So we start with these building blocks. I've shown you over and over again, but this really is the primordial pieces of making galaxies. And if you're a spiral galaxy, you, you form slowly, you 
have things fall in smoothly and, and make a nice ordered disk and grow up to be a beautiful spiral galaxy. If you're a big collision or if you're in the early universe and everything's coming together so fast you don't have time to build a nice spiral disk, then you end up being an elliptical galaxy. Now I should say, you know, I'm, I'm categorizing, categorizing things as spiral or elliptical. Astronomers like to put things in boxes, right? In reality, there's lots of small galaxies that don't look quite spiral, don't look quite elliptical. Some of these are regular galaxies, have properties of both. You know, they rotate like spirals, but they don't have young stars in them. And so there's, there's still, you know, I, I'm, I'm painting to you a picture here but happily, that picture still has a lot of questions to ask. So on even larger scales, you form galaxies by having gravity pull them together into groups, and then those groups assemble into the clusters today. And so the galaxy clusters are some of the most recent things that have formed, because they're big, and remember we said that's the big things are the ones that take a long time to collapse. So your picture of the universe is that little things form first, they assemble into become bigger things, and so you're left with this paradoxical picture where galaxy clusters, the last things to form, they hold some of the oldest galaxies because those galaxies formed early and it's only now that they're coming together to form the cluster. This is the magic of hierarchical collapse. This lecture is part of the Origin Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It has been brought to you with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins.